All right, now. Yes, Mom, I've got it. What's that? From George. Hmm. Oh, yes, the ticket he told me about. Well, let's see what he has to say. Here's the latest on my broken ankle. Doc says I'll be all right, only I have to stay off my feet for a week or so. Anyway, here's the ticket for the high team carnival. It's too late to turn it in, so you have yourself a time and tell me all about it. One couple. That means a date. Not like just going around with the crowd. Just me and the girl. Well, that's all right. Only, what girl? Who? How do you choose a date? Whose company would you enjoy? Well, one thing you can consider is looks. Woody thought of Janice and how good looking she was. He'd really have to rate to date somebody like her. Yes, he'd enjoy that, except, well, it's too bad Janice always acts so superior and bored. She'd make a fellow feel awkward and inferior. Well, perhaps someone who doesn't feel superior. There's Betty, and yet it just doesn't seem as if she'd be much fun. What about Anne? She knows how to have a good time and how to make the fellow with her relax, have fun too. Yes, that's what a boy likes. He wants to know he's appreciated. Anne would be fun on a date. So Woody decided he'd ask Anne for this first date. But just how should he ask her? And what if she refused? No, it won't be easy asking for that first date. Well, Woody. Huh? Hi, Ed. What you doing? Just thinking. Don't work too hard. Ed, is this private? No. Stick around if you like. Well, hello, Edward. I thought I heard you come in. Hi, Mom. What's for supper? Oh, Mom. Is it all right with you if I have a date Saturday night? Well, of course. You generally go out on Saturdays. Uh, hello. May I speak to Mary, please? But, Mom, this is different. A date. I... Well, I haven't asked her yet, but I'd like to take Aunt Davis to the high teen carnival. Oh, Anne's a nice girl, but... a date? Well, you're rather young. Oh, Mom, give him a break. I think he can swing it. We all have to start sometime. Well, if you don't overdo on dating, Ed knows what I mean. Weekends only, and not too late. Thanks, Mary. Mom. I just call up to check on the night. I think I can get by a little earlier than usual. How's 7.30? All right, Mary. Bye now. Boy, you sure make it sound easy. How do you do it? Practice, my boy. Experience. But I don't think I'll know what to say, what to talk about. Now, oh, don't worry about that. Just be your natural, talkative old self. Come on, let's see what's for supper. Wait a second. Oh, Mom, is the floor dry yet? Yes, you can come in. Hello, Mrs. Davis. This is Woody. Or, I mean, Alan Woodruff. May I speak to Anne? How do you ask for a date? 
What about this? Uh, Ian? Well, uh, how about a date? Uh, well, I mean... Well, really? No thanks, Woody. Hmm. Well, suppose he did it this way. Hi, uh, Ann. What you doing Saturday night? Well, I... I guess I'm busy. Oh, yeah? Any chance of giving him the brush off for me? Full of all the nerve! Well, is there another way? Ann? This is Woody. Well, I have a ticket for the high team carnival Saturday, and... Well, would you like to go? Why, yes, Woody. I'll have to talk to my folks about it, but I think I can go. That would be fun. Yeah. Well, shall I pick you up about 8 o'clock? That's fine, Woody. 8 o'clock Saturday. I think it'll be all right, but I'll let you know for sure. Bye. A date with Woody. Saturday. <laughs> I'm getting ready for my date tonight with Woody. Oh, he's nice. A date, huh? What'll you do? Go to some fancy place for dinner? No, silly. We're going to the high teen carnival. And then he'll bring me home. Oh, that doesn't sound like much. Why, we'd have fun at the carnival, you and I, wouldn't we? Oh, yes. Well, Woody and I are going to have fun in just that way. I think the important thing about a date is to have a good time. And you don't need to spend a lot of money to do that. You just enjoy whatever you're doing. Whether it's movies or parties or anything. And you leave your boyfriend enough money so he'll ask you again. My, you'll be out late. Why not particularly late? Mom and Dad and I have an agreement about what time to come in. Look, um, will you be a honey and get my stockings from the bathroom? Sure. Do we have any cleaning fluid? There's a spot on my coat. Oh, goodness, you know we have some. Oh, here, let me. No, no, I'll do it. That's it, son. Look your best. Your first date is mighty important. To you. Yeah. Dad, were you excited the night of your first date? I sure was. <laughs> So was I. I took my date seriously. A date was a major event. Why, the night of my first date, <laughs> my date had a flat tire and he was an hour late. And he didn't even bother to call me. Well, when he finally came, I had to run upstairs and do my face and my hair all over again. Oh, I was so upset. That fella had a lot to learn about girls. Your mother lost all interest in him after she met me. And the moral of that story is that I should be on time tonight, right? You bet. And the same goes for Anne. Any girl who can't be ready on time for a date isn't good enough for my boy. Well, what are you doing? <laughs> oh, go find a mirror so you can see yourself. <laughs> hi, Woody. Oh, hi. Big night, eh? Yeah. Flowers. Anne won't expect flowers, will she? Huh? Oh, I hardly think so. I'm taking these to Mary because it's a special occasion. Of course, if you want to take flowers anyway, I guess there's no law against it. But... But I don't have to, unless it's a ritzy affair. That's the general idea. Flowers for a prom or a very special party. Otherwise, you don't need to. Say, I'll have to run. Me too. See you later. I'm going, folks.
But when you're having so much fun, time goes all too fast. Well, it's the time Ann had set for getting home. And now, good night. The end of a perfect evening. But how do you say good night? Perhaps. Don't please. What is? Or it could go this way. Well, so long. Just like that. After all, a girl likes to know you've had a good time. So let's try saying good night again. One more way. Well, it's getting late. Yes, it is. I'd ask you in for a bite to eat if it weren't so late. Um, let's plan to get home in time for a sandwich or something next time. Say, that sounds good. I'll call you next week. Will you? Well, thanks so much. I had loads of fun. So did I. Good night, Woody. Night, Anne. is on dating, the etiquette of dating. We are going to follow some of these students as they go on a date and see if their manners have anything to do with their fun. Everyone thinks that his own manners are all right, even if they aren't perfect. And that being correct only helps to spoil. Let us compare what these students do and with what we think. Let's compare ourselves with Margaret or with Helen, or with two fellows who are particularly interested in them. The junior prom, a semi-formal, is the best dance of the year and is announced early. Jerry is the shorter of the two. He believes that he who hesitates is lost and that the time to ask for a date is now. Margaret, for her part, believes that a girl shouldn't make it difficult for a fellow to ask for a date. Fear of not being asked, or fear of being refused, can ruin our social lives if we let them. How do you act? Natural, at ease, graciously? Or are you shy? Like Frank, do you blurt out invitations? Actually, Helen is glad to receive the invitation, and Frank is surprised. Getting dates is not hard if one will act with a bit of courage and show himself to be sincere. A week before the prom, Jerry asks Margaret to help Frank by finding out what Helen intends to wear to the dance. But Frank isn't thinking far enough ahead to realize that he will soon be selecting a corsage for Helen and that the corsage should harmonize with the color of the dress to be worn. He should also find out the type of corsage she prefers. So Jerry steers Margaret into a discussion of corsages. She recalls the ones she likes best. Gardenias, spring flowers, an orchid once, camellias. She and Jerry have been dating for a long while. She appreciates the good taste he has shown in choosing flowers that suited her dress and complexion. The wearing of flowers on the wrist, the shoulder, or in the hair is a matter of preference. When Frank finally asks Helen about her preferences, she is glad to tell him that she likes all types of corsages and all flowers except gardenias. 
All the other preparations for their double date are also talked over. The night of the prom, Frank is glad that the dance is semi-formal and that the wearing of a tuxedo is optional. But even with a dark business suit, so Jerry insists, the color of the tie should be conservative. The socks should match the tie, not clash with it. We dress according to the occasion. A dignified occasion requires dignified clothes. As a matter of convention, men wear dark clothing at formal or semi-formal affairs. Thus, perhaps, they allow the ladies, by contrast, to be more colorful in their dress. This tie may not seem conservative by your standards, but it seems to be the mildest that Frank owns. Perhaps for the next dance, he will buy a quieter pattern, something that won't compete with the colors he expects the girl to be wearing. In that sense, he will be showing consideration for her, a gesture of friendliness. And that is what etiquette really is, doing unto others as you would have them do unto you. Correctness in dress, like other matters of etiquette, is something which has to be learned. One needs to check on himself and inquire from those who know what is correct. Of course, women usually receive more training than men in the etiquette of dress because of its importance to their appearing always to best advantage. But girls have their problems just as fellows do, and what they think is in good taste may not be. Naturally, everyone thinks that what he or she likes should be considered correct. But most girls are inclined to overdress. Even the word of parents is not always accepted. Mother is called old-fashioned. But Margaret will take Helen's word for it that she is wearing too many ornaments. Simplicity is always the safest policy in ornamentation. Correctness of dress for an occasion includes not only the choice of gown and slippers, but the hairdo and the accessories, the jewelry, and, yes, the face makeup. The rules are simple, logical, and easy to remember, and they are very important. Frank doesn't look happy, and he isn't. But how much of his fearfulness is actually a lack of confidence in his manners? Whether he admits it to himself or not, his unsureness is painful and is already interfering with his enjoyment of the date. His wanting to blow the horn for Helen instead of going into the house to meet her parents and to escort her out is really not shyness, but a sign that his manners are weak. He hasn't taken the trouble to learn how to meet people easily. Helen tries to introduce him first to her mother, who has risen to shake hands with him. Ladies are always introduced first, and they may offer to shake hands or not, as circumstances warrant. Frank forgot that he should present the corsage to Helen at home so that she may put it on there if she prefers, rather than carrying it to the dance. Notice that Jerry acknowledges the introduction to Helen's mother with a nod, since she elected to remain seated and did not offer to shake hands. Frank shouldn't open the corsage box, but allow Helen that pleasure. Since Helen does not wish to put the flower on now, Frank should take care of it and see that it is not damaged. But give him credit for assisting Helen with her wrap. Helen's parents are glad to have met the boys with whom she is going out. And on the boys' part, meeting the parents is a minimal courtesy as well as a pleasure. Good manners never interfere with fun. They should be happy. And habits of correctness are just as easy to learn as bad habits. Correctness has the real advantage of allowing one always to be at ease. Jerry has been here often and is right at home. However, the ease with which he enters into a conversation is based on his genuine interest in other people and what they are thinking. 
Meanwhile, Frank is laboring to interest Helen in what is his, not her, chief interest, sports. Margaret is careful not to keep Jerry waiting. She doesn't believe that keeping a fellow waiting a long time will allow her a more dramatic entrance and thus increase his interest. Rightly, she depends on the charm of her personality to hold his attention, not upon little games. So that Jerry feels he is dealing with her true self at all times. The phone call is from one of those fellows who wait until the very last minute to try making a date. Jerry can laugh at his would-be competitor. Margaret is gracious, of course, but brief. There is no excuse for last-minute requests for a date. No girl is flattered at the idea that she hadn't already received an invitation. Besides, a lot of the fun in dating is in the anticipation. And right now, they are well along in their fun. But Frank and Margaret have problems with conversation. Margaret has tried to talk about the dates she has had with other fellows. She meant only to be entertaining, but such topics irritate rather than interest. Perhaps, she and Frank hope, the dance will furnish better topics. Now they have arrived, and all the fun they hoped for lies ahead. Dances are intended for enjoyment, and the rules of etiquette which apply to dances are, again, customs which have grown out of one person's anticipating the wishes and feelings of others. A gentleman doesn't dash off just because he sees a friend and wants to say hello. He waits as his lady removes her wrap. He allows her time to pin on her corsage and powder a bit if she wishes. He saves her any feeling of being deserted or of possible embarrassment in entering the dance unescorted. Ladies expect and appreciate such courtesies, just as they enjoy the thoughtfulness shown in presenting them with a well-chosen corsage or enjoy being properly escorted. In meeting their hosts and hostesses, Margaret isn't always as aware as she should be of Jerry's attempts to escort her smoothly. And if Frank realized that his awkwardness, in contrast to Jerry, is due to his not being sure about introductions, he would learn the simple rules in a hurry. Introduce a man to a woman, a younger woman to an older woman, a younger man to an older man. The name of the person to whom deference is shown is always mentioned first. The person who is to be introduced waits until the introduction is made, and then waits for the other to offer his hand. Only a few friendly remarks are made. After greeting the sponsors, the first thing that Jerry sees to is that they select a rendezvous so that they will have a definite place during the evening for meeting after dances. Then they begin filling in their dance programs. When programs are filled out in advance, and then one or two couples don't attend after having exchanged dances, the programs are left with gaps that are hard to fill. So it is perhaps better to wait until dances can be exchanged with those friends who are present. Then the dances that have been promised can be written in. The purpose of the program is not to exclude others, but the opposite, to plan for exchanging as many dances as possible. In that way, everyone dances with his friends and makes new friends. It is not a mark of affection for a couple to try dancing the entire evening by themselves. For after a while, they tire of their exclusiveness, and then each one fears to hurt the other's feelings by wanting to dance with someone else. It is customary, though, for a couple to reserve for themselves the first and last dance. Frank forgets it and has to be straightened out. But now that they have gotten to dancing, let's hope that their troubles are the way they have hoped. However, let us watch to see if their enjoyment depends in part, at least, on their manners. All that they ask 
ask is that they be allowed to talk and to dance, to be with their friends, and enjoy each other's company. yourself as you fill it, then present it. Getting jealous? They're only enjoying themselves. Frank, be sensible, Mark. Frank, you're wrong. She hasn't lost interest in you. It's foolish to be jealous. Your own fun you're spoiling. As the dance is drawing to a close, and it is time to say good night to the sponsors, everyone seems to have had a good time, except Frank. The dancing hasn't worked out as he and Margaret hoped. But Jerry and Helen are at fault, too. They have allowed Frank and Margaret to become jealous. Of course, they aren't justified. Margaret made the mistake of trying to be too entertaining. Frank allowed his fears to make him wooden. People never like to blame themselves, so they blame others. All that either needs to do is to learn how to be natural and talk of what is interesting to the other person, as well as to himself. Meanwhile, a good deal of the fun has gone out of the evening. Even though Margaret pretends that nothing has happened and all is well. Naturally, we all learn through experience, but that is usually the long and the hard way. We can learn much faster and save ourselves from being hurt so often if we realize that our social lives are filled with problems of etiquette and that these must be studied. We must observe our own behavior, compare it with what is proper, and be certain that our habits are correct. Jerry's example in suggesting to Margaret a dish that she might like is one that Frank might follow. As he finally realizes, since it tells Helen in a nice way how much he can afford to spend. This saves embarrassment all around. At last, Jerry is becoming aware that Frank and Margaret are not having a good time. He doesn't ignore the situation, but brings the problem out into the open. Margaret and Frank are forced to admit their own foolishness. After all, Helen and Jerry had simply been at ease during the dance and enjoyed themselves. They hadn't been any the less interested in their partners. There was absolutely no reason for jealousy. You notice that Frank is becoming more alert. He orders for Helen correctly. And maybe we can hope that he has decided to turn over a new leaf. This way is more fun. The meal has been happy, and now that everyone is happy again, the date is moving along as it should. The mistakes that have been discovered won't be repeated, and those that haven't yet been discovered will come to light as they pay more attention to their manners. 
But already they have learned some valuable lessons, Frank particularly. He has learned to begin with that he shouldn't let his fears stop him from asking for the date in the first place and that he should ask right away, not fret about it. He is glad now that he learned a little more about selecting a corsage and about how he should dress. To learn how to be easy during introductions and in making ordinary conversations. But you saw that he was quick to pay the bill, including a 10% tip, and that he found it pleasant to help Helen with a rat. On the way home, there are no problems. They are happy in knowing that this is just the beginning of happy times ahead. Jerry not only sees Margaret home, but opens the door for her. And then, well, they've been going steady for some time now, and there are some customs that are very enjoyable. But now Frank has a new problem. Should he try on a first date? He makes certain that he helps Helen from the car correctly. She waited properly for him to come around the car. He sees her to her door and thanks her for having gone out with him. And he remembers to open the door for her. Oh, he should not try to kiss her goodnight, not on a first date. But he does ask her for another date soon. Helen is quite happy to accept. So their first date is a definite success. Our ending is only a beginning of other dates to follow, of a new attitude toward manners. Ladies and gentlemen, that was the 10 o'clock news. Ricky's mother and father have come home late from shopping this evening. Ricky's grandmother is sleeping on the couch and the television is still on. But they're not happy to see Ricky still up at 10.30. He should have gone to bed at 8.30. Did he take his bath? Did he finish his arithmetic paper? Well, no time for all that now. It'll have to wait until morning. But in the morning, when Mother wakes him up to get ready for school, Ricky is still tired. You know why. The bathroom won't be empty for long. Everyone else is getting ready for the day, except Ricky. Lucky for him, his sister just came by. He's going to be late. But now his brother is in the bathroom. He'll have to get dressed before he washes up. But he wants a red shirt to match the shirt his friend Pete is going to wear. Where's his red shirt? He should have asked yesterday. Now it's there with the other ironing. No time to iron it this morning. Ricky's gotten dressed fast. He still hasn't washed. Uh-oh, his arithmetic. Everyone's eating breakfast. But where's Ricky? Working his jigsaw puzzle. He hasn't even washed up yet. No wonder his mother is angry. And he still hasn't finished his arithmetic. He doesn't even have time to eat his breakfast. What a way to get ready for school. And that was a good breakfast his mother made for him, too. He didn't comb his hair. He didn't brush his teeth. 
But even worse, he forgot his arithmetic paper, which he didn't even finish. That's not being very responsible. Late again. This happens often, and yet Ricky doesn't know why. We do. After school, Ricky's friend Pete is waiting for him. Ricky's going to spend the night at Pete's house. He'll go to school right from there. His teacher gave him one more chance to finish his arithmetic. So he'll do it tonight. We hope. At Pete's house that evening, Ricky has enjoyed the dinner and thanks Pete's mother. Ricky and Pete were building a city before dinner. Ricky wants to finish it now. No, there's something else Pete wants to do first. This book is due at the school library tomorrow. Pete wants to be sure he finishes it this evening. Doesn't Ricky have something to do himself? His arithmetic? He ought to do it now to be sure it's ready for school tomorrow. And so, not much later, Pete has finished his book and Ricky has finished his arithmetic. Now they can build their city, can't they? What does Pete want to do now? This is the hall table. Pete always puts things here that he wants to take to school. That seems like a good idea to Ricky, too. Now the city can get built. They have lots of time. It's only seven o'clock, and Pete doesn't go to bed until 8.30. But at 7.30, Pete's mother says it's time to start getting ready for bed. But they still have an hour. Of course. That's why now is the time to start. They both want to take showers. Pete's mother gave Ricky his own towel and told him where to hang it. They want to have milk and cookies, too. That takes time. But they've given themselves enough time to do all the things they need to do to get ready for tomorrow. By 8.15, they're finished. And there's still some time left to play checkers. It seems to Ricky that he never has this much time at home. Now Pete's mother wants to help Pete get his clothes ready for tomorrow. Ricky knows that's a good idea. His mother usually helps him do that at home, too. Is there anything else the boys need? Did Pete's mother remember the jar he needs for school? She's glad he reminded her. It'll be on the hall table for Pete in the morning. A triple jump. Ricky wins that game. How about another? Is there time? No, it's after 8.30. Not even for just one more game? Not if they want to get the sleep they need. Good night. Good morning, 7.30, time to get up. Pete gets right up. Ricky isn't used to getting up when his mother wakes him, but he's not as tired as usual. They have to use the bathroom now. Pete's brother will want to use it in a little while. Ricky knows which towel is his. It's right where he left it last night. Putting all his clothes out the night before makes it easy to get dressed fast. This is Pete's brother. He's come to tell them that breakfast is almost ready. But Pete seems to need a little help. The snap won't close. There. It's a good idea to get help when you need it. Pete's hair needs combing. So does Ricky's, and he has a comb. His mother planned ahead for him.
Where's Pete going? Oh, to hang up his pajamas. Time for breakfast. Ricky likes cereal and toast, too. Is there enough time to eat? Lots of time. They don't have to leave until 8.30. Imagine a breakfast where you don't have to hurry. Ricky likes that. Where's Pete? Oh, here he is. He got the paper. That's his regular job. It helps his mother. Ricky notices that Pete's mother doesn't have to tell him to do things all the time, the way his mother does. You feel more grown up when you don't have to be reminded all the time. Breakfast is fun at Pete's house. Now it's time to leave for school. The things they want to take with them are on the hall table. Ricky will pick up his pajamas after school. Ricky likes Pete's way of getting ready for school. He's going to try it. Can he do it? Getting ready for school begins the night before. Grandma thinks that someone must be sick. Ricky isn't sick. He's just trying to get ready for school the way Pete does. Everyone thinks that's a good idea. He keeps trying the next morning. Today, Ricky has enough time to eat all his breakfast with his family. Everyone likes this new Ricky. After breakfast, he even has time to talk to his father before he goes to work. He doesn't forget the paper he wants to take to school. It's going to be a wonderful day. Was it hard getting ready for school this new way? Yes, breaking old habits is always hard. Perhaps Ricky won't be as good every day as he was today, but he's going to keep on trying. It's three o'clock and school is out. The children can't wait to start playing. What will the boys do this afternoon? Jimmy, Steve, and Bobby are talking it over. Jimmy is a new boy at school, and he'd like Bobby and Steve to come over to his house to play. He said a lot of things they could do. He'd like his new friends to come. Bobby and Steve are glad to be invited. Jimmy explains where his home is and says they can walk home with him right now. Steve thinks that's a good idea. But Bobby doesn't. He's going home to tell his mother where he will play. Who coming, Steve? Steve knows that's the right thing to do. They'll both go home first and see Jimmy a little later. This is one of the streets that Bobby and Steve and the other children cross each day on their way home. All the children wait at the curb seeing guard signal. They walk carefully between the two lines and they don't run or push or shove. But some of the things they might do at Jimmy's house that they're not watching where they're walking. Uh-oh. Steve has hurt himself. It's not too serious, but it could have been a lot worse. 
someone wasn't careful about where he left his bicycle. Never leave bicycles or toys on sidewalks. And always look where you walk, whether you're walking on a sidewalk or crossing a street. A car stops and the driver calls to the boys. The man seems to know Bobby. He says he's Mr. Arnold, a friend of Bobby's father. Bobby thinks he knows Mr. Arnold, but he's not sure. But Bobby knows that he must not ride home with anybody unless he has permission from his father or mother. He tells Mr. Arnold, no, thank you. Mr. Arnold knows that the boys are following a safety rule. Don't ride with anyone unless you have permission from your parents. Yes, the boys are remembering their safety rules after school. Here's another one. Look both ways before you cross. At home, Bobby asks for permission to go with Steve to Jimmy's house. Bobby's mother says yes. She knows that Bobby is old enough to take care of himself. But he must be home by 5 o'clock. Bobby understands, and he will be careful. And Steve will go, too, if his mother gives him permission. But his knee hurts a little. Bobby explains that Steve hurt his knee on the way home from school. Bobby's mother is glad that the boys mentioned this, because now she can help. She'll have a look at the knee. A little first aid is probably all that Steve needs. While she gets a bandage for the cut, Steve is going to call his mother to ask about going to Jimmy's. Of course, he knows his phone number and how to dial it. Calling home to ask permission or to let your mother know where you are is another way to practice safety after school. Can he go to Jimmy's? His mother says yes, but she wants him home by 5 o'clock. Steve says he will be home on time. And now let's see about that knee. It's just skinned up a bit. Bobby's mother washes Steve's cut with soap and water. It's always best to take care of a cut right away so it won't get dirty or infected. Next, she puts on a clean bandage. There. The bandage is in place, and Steve will be able to play safely. Now let's see if the boys think about safety on their way to Jimmy's house. There's something that isn't safe. It's very dangerous to ride a bicycle that way. Well, looks like the Johnsons have a new dog. He seems friendly enough. Steve wants to pet the dog. Does that seem safe? Bobby says no. The dog may be unfriendly. It's best not to be too friendly with strange animals. Now Bobby and Steve are coming to a street they've never crossed before. If they cross between the parked cars, they can't see the traffic too well. And the drivers may not see them. Never cross in the middle of a block. Steve and Bobby do the right thing. They walk to the corner. They look both ways and cross safely. Just across the street, some new apartments are being built. Wouldn't it be fun playing here? There are so many places to hide. And so many things to climb. And look, there's a fire where scrap wood is being burned. Some boys are playing near the fire. Bobby and Steve know this is dangerous. The other boys know they shouldn't be doing this. That's why they run when the workmen come. 
The workman tells Bobby and Steve that they can't play here either. It's not safe. Why, just a while ago, he says, the wind knocked down some of those large boards. Someone could have been hurt very easily. No, this is not a safe place to play. Anyway, Jimmy is probably waiting. They'd better hurry. Jimmy is raking in his backyard. A yard is usually a safe place to be, if we help keep it safe. Jimmy drops the rake when he sees his friends. Is this safe? Someone might trip over the rake, or even worse, step on the sharp teeth. He picks up the rake so nobody will get hurt. Jimmy's mother says he may go now and play with his friends. Where shall they go? Jimmy knows a place where they can play safely. It's a playground in a park near Jimmy's house. Steve knows what he'd like to do. Climb the monkey bars. Jimmy's trying the swings. Notice how he gets off. He doesn't jump. Before he gets off, he makes sure the swing is almost stopped. One of Steve's shoes has become untied. He'll tie it before he climbs up again. A loose shoelace can make you trip. Bobby has found some broken glass near the sandbox. He picks it up very carefully so he doesn't cut himself. He'll put it where it belongs, in the trash basket. But even in safe places, like a playground, accidents can happen. So everyone should always be careful. Time to go home. Bobby and Steve promise to be home by 5 o'clock, and they will. They'll see Jimmy in school tomorrow. At home, Bobby tells his mother what a good time he had. She's pleased that Bobby can take care of himself and can be trusted to follow the rules of safety. You can follow the same rules that Bobby did for your safety after school. Safely to school. It's about Janie, who is starting out with her mother, Mrs. Brown, to learn the safest way to walk to school. The Browns moved into the neighborhood only yesterday. So Mrs. Brown asked Fred Martin, third grader across the street, to show them the way, if his mother agreed. Mrs. Martin said, of course, and now they're on their way. If we pretend to be looking down from an airplane, we see the Brown and Martin Holmes. Fred stays on his sidewalk and walks to the stop sign corner. The sign is for cars, which must come to a stop and only then go on. Fred has learned the safest thing to do is to look for himself in all directions and cross only when no cars are coming. As you can see, Fred is not crossing in the middle of the block. He is crossing from corner to corner, which is always the right thing to do. On the next block, there are no sidewalks. Here, Fred walks facing traffic. The law is that people on foot must face oncoming traffic so that they will be sure to see cars coming toward them. Fred, Janie, and Mrs. Brown walk single file to leave plenty of room for cars passing them. The drivers can see them from a block away since they are wearing light-colored clothing.
The next corner has no light and no signal. Fred explains to Janie that everyone's eyes and ears are the best signals of all. Fred looks in all directions. When he is sure nothing is coming, he leads the way across. At corners like this, Fred learned long ago that every girl or boy must be his own traffic policeman. Danger, a hidden driveway. Fred shows what to do. Stop and look and then go. Play it safe every time. Just as dangerous is the alley in the next block. Mrs. Brown and Janie followed Fred's caution. They stopped, looked, and then went across. The alley is almost as wide as a street. Once past the alley, our group approaches their first signal light crossing. By the time Fred and the Browns reach the signal light corner, they find an old green burning. They wait. Fred explains to Janie why the green is called an old green. It has been shining for quite a few seconds and must change very soon without giving time for a safe crossing. Then will come a short yellow and the red light. After the red light will come the new green, the safe green. There, the new green. The three go on. One car is stopped for the light. Here, Fred and his friends pause to make sure no other car is coming in the next lane. When there are more than two lanes, Fred knows it is always wise to stop and look down each lane. Fred tells Mrs. Brown and Janie their walk is almost over. Across the busy main street is the school. Here, all school children must cross only when the crossing guard directs the way. The guard can be an officer in uniform. He can be an older student, usually wearing an armband. Or in this neighborhood, an older person, sometimes a woman, sometimes a man. The crossing guard carries a stop sign. When he is sure all cars have stopped, he signals for the waiting children to walk across with him. Boys and girls who have ridden bicycles push their bikes across. Mrs. Brown tells Janie to wait for her after kindergarten is out. Janie understands she must wait at the curb until her mother drives up. When the kindergarten children leave, Janie walks to the curb. She waits until her mother brings the car to a stop. Mrs. Brown has obeyed the law by stopping on the school side of the street. Also, she did not double park, and Janie did not have to cross the street to meet her. As a third grader, Fred's school day ends later. Walking home alone is an old story to Fred. The way home is almost, but not quite the same as going to school.
There's no change at the busy main street. With other boys and girls waiting to cross, Fred watches while the guard makes sure it is safe to go. At the traffic light crossing, Fred finds the light red, which means stop. He waits for the light to change to a new green. Then he crosses. By waiting for the new green, Fred has made certain that he will have plenty of time for crossing. Fred now comes to the street with no sidewalk. Going to school, Fred, Mrs. Brown and Janie walked single file facing traffic. No matter which way you are going, you must always face traffic if there is no sidewalk. This afternoon, going home, Fred walks on the other side of the street. He can see the drivers of cars coming toward him, and they can see Fred. That's the safe way. Now Fred reaches the corner with no light. He looks, and he listens. He crosses. It's the same at the stop sign crossing. Fred listens, looks, and when he knows it's safe, he crosses. Here, when Fred was learning how to walk safely, his father used to say, let your eyes and ears be your traffic policemen. And so ends Fred's day. It's time to play now. His mother knows he's safely home and is very proud that Fred could pass on the rules of safety to his new neighbors, Janie and Mrs. Brown. And to lots of other places. With so many of us going so many places, we have paths, sidewalks, streets, and highways on which we can go in an orderly manner. Sometimes we walk, and sometimes we ride on bicycles or in cars. All this movement of walking and riding from place to place is called traffic. And in order to make it possible for all of us to go places easily and safely, there are certain things we all must do. Do you have any idea what these things are? You mean like cars are supposed to stay off the sidewalks? That could be one example. Imagine how dangerous it could be if cars drove down sidewalks. It wouldn't be very safe for those who were walking, would it? No, and people aren't supposed to stand around in the streets either, or they might get hurt. That's right. If people stood around in the streets, getting in the way of cars, this would be dangerous too. So we realize there are certain things we must do in traffic. But why must we do these things? So we won't get hurt. That's the main reason. Can we think of another reason? Sometimes, isn't it, so we won't be selfish? Yes. We mustn't ever forget that streets and sidewalks are for everybody. So we must share them by being courteous and considerate of each other. Now, we have a name for these things we must do in traffic to shoot others and avoid getting hurt. What do we call them? You mean like, look both ways before you cross the street? Yes. That's a rule. You bet it is. We have traffic rules which help us be good citizens by reminding us to be alert, careful, courteous, and considerate. Can we think of some more rules? How about stop, look, and listen at a train crossing? That's a rule that reminds us to be alert, so we'll make sure we know if a train is coming. Go for cars to make them slow down. Yes, there's a rule that drivers must slow down and be extra careful to watch for children when they drive past schools and playgrounds. Are signal lights at crossings to make us take turns? Yes, signal lights help us be courteous 
by telling traffic going one way to stop, so traffic going the other way may go. One rule when you're riding a bike is that you must signal when you're going to turn a corner. That's so we'll be considerate by letting others know just what we're going to do. There are lots of other traffic rules, too, and a good citizen learns all the rules that apply to him. In fact, there's no excuse for anyone not knowing the rules, is there? No. Now, here's an important question. Whose job is it to enforce the rules and see to it that we all are alert, careful, courteous, and considerate, and that nobody gets hurt? That's what policemen are for. Sure, that's a policeman's job. At first, it may seem that way, but that's not entirely true. It certainly is the traffic policeman's job to help people learn the rules and to remind them when they break the rules. But traffic policemen can't be everywhere at once. If each one of us had to have a special traffic policeman to watch over us all the time, that'd be pretty silly. There are so many more people to watch than there are policemen, it just wouldn't be possible. And it isn't necessary. Boys and girls who want to be considerate of others and avoid getting hurt must learn to be their own traffic policemen. Oh, what do we do first? It's not as difficult as it may sound. Now think hard. What's the first thing you might do if you wanted to be your own traffic policeman? Well, to be a policeman, you'd have to know the rules. Yes, that would be absolutely necessary. And after we learn the rules, then what? Then we'd have to follow the rules. Right. And that's all there is to it. If you know the rules and follow the rules, then you can be your own traffic policeman. You mean we'll get badges and uniforms? No, you don't get a uniform or a badge. Actually, your own traffic policeman will be up inside your head, where you do your learning and thinking. You won't be able to really see your policeman, but we can pretend we can see him like this, just to make it easier to talk about. We can imagine he looks like us in a uniform, because he's part of us. The part which learns and thinks about traffic rules and traffic courtesy. If you have learned the rules, and have really practiced following them, your own traffic policeman will be there to help you whenever he's needed. Get the idea? Sure. All right, let's play a game. I'll start a story, and you pretend that you're the boy or girl in the story, so we can see if your policeman is on the job. Jack, let's start with you. Let's pretend that we're on a busy street in the city. And here you come, Jack, going nowhere in particular. Then suddenly you hear a voice calling, Hey, Jack! And there's your friend Larry with a new airplane. Naturally, you want to see it, so you start... Hey! Why, what's the matter? We're forgetting to be alert. We should go down and cross at the corner. We might get hurt if we run out in the street in the middle of the block. You're right, Jack. Crossing in the middle of the block is dangerous. Drivers might not see us in time to avoid an accident. We should always cross carefully at the corner. Let's try another story. Of course, we know we should walk on sidewalks, but sometimes there are no sidewalks, like here by this road in the country. And here you come, Betty, taking a walk to gather wildflowers. It's a beautiful... Wait! Story. We're forgetting to be careful. Why? We can't see the cars coming on our side of the road, so it's dangerous. Yes, this isn't safe, unless we happen to have extra eyes in the back of our head to warn us when cars are coming. What do we do about it, Betty? We should carefully cross the road to the other side, so we can walk facing the cars. Then we'll be sure and keep out of the way. Good, Betty. Now let's try Jack on another one. We're back in town near your house, Jack. You and Pete are playing ball. Or rather, trying to. It's much too crowded to play here. So you decide to move out in the nearby street where there seems to be more room. Are you just... Hey, wait! Playing in the street is dangerous. And it's also selfish. Why? Streets are for cars, and kids shouldn't get in their way. You're right. So what should you do about it? 
Go to a playground. But what if the playground is too far away? Even if you have to walk quite a ways to a playground, isn't that better than taking a chance on causing an accident? Yes. Here you are again, Betty, having a race with Susan on the sidewalk near your house. You're in the lead, but Susan's a good skater, so you're keeping a watchful eye on her to be sure she doesn't catch up. Looks like maybe... Dad! Not. We're forgetting to be considerate of others who may be using the sidewalk. Right, Betty. We must watch where we're going and travel at a safe speed so others can share the sidewalks without getting hurt. That's enough of our game. And you're both doing very well. What do you think of this idea of being your own traffic policeman? I like that it. It's fun. Then we're agreed. From now on, each one of us will be his own traffic policeman? Sure. Yeah. All right. What are you going to do first? First, we're going to learn all the... Yes, and then what? Oh. And that's all there is to it. But you have to really try and practice all the time, or it won't work. Okay? We will. Yeah. And how about you? Are you going to be your own traffic policeman? My brown sweater. Your what? My brown sweater, the one with the buttons down the front. Did you look in here? When uh, when was the last time you wore it? Last week I wore one, Dean. I don't remember exactly. Here it is, hanging on a hook. Now you really ought to take better care of your things than that. Well, there's never any extra hangers in there when I need one. What's the matter? Is there something wrong with this shirt? No, no, shirt's fine. But so is the one you wore to school today. You don't usually change just to go over to David's. Well, the uh, plans have been changed. We're going over to Nancy's place instead. Oh, who's we? Well, I'll just David and I, and some friend of Nancy's is going to be there. The oh, family just moved here, and she's in a lot of Nancy's classes. Well, listen, have a good time, dear. But you remember now that tomorrow is school, I know. all right? I won't be late. All right, dear. Bye-bye. Come on. Hi. Hi. Come on in. Let me take your coat. Thanks. Hey, that's sharp. Oh, thanks. David and Paul aren't here yet. I know. I came a little bit early because I wanted to be here when they got here. Come on in here and meet my father. Dad? Hmm? Dad, I want you to meet Carol. Carol, this is my father. Hello, Carol. Hello, Mr. Wilson. Hello, Carol. Hello, Mrs. Wilson. How are you? Fine, thanks. Nancy, if you kids want a cold drink later, there's some soda in the refrigerator. Okay, thanks, Mom. Come on, Carol. Let's go downstairs. David is bringing Paul over tonight. And there's been a good deal of phoning back and forth during the last couple of days. You women are all alike. Can't stand to see a man single. <laughs> Poor guy doesn't realize he's being snared. And that is a story which you men have kept alive for years. I don't think we have to worry about Paul. It seems to me he goes along with Nancy's plans for him because he and David are such good friends. Anyway, he takes a girl out once or twice and that's the end of it. Well, word of honor, man. I don't know any more about her than you do. Well, I've seen her around. And I said hello to her once when Nancy introduced me to her at the restaurant after school on Friday. Sharp looking, but she's not my type. Hi, guys. Hi. Good morning. Downstairs in the back room. Hi, Nancy. Hi. Oh, hi. Uh, hi, Paul. Hi. What's this about women's ears? Oh, Another inquiring female. Oh, buddy, we are surrounded. Hold it. Hold it. You two have been going together so long you sound like an old married couple. Let's just forget the whole thing. No, I have a better idea. Gather around and I'll explain the whole thing. You're making a terrible mistake, man. Well, when you try to explain anything to a woman, you only get yourself into trouble. You just don't understand him, my boy. Relax and give a listen to your old Uncle Paul. Now, rule number one is never let a woman know. Your old Uncle Paul? Hmm. Well, I suppose if David and I look like an old married couple, he can be Uncle Paul. Look at him. Five minutes in the same room with the new girl, and already he's an authority on human relations. I wonder if David thinks of us 
as an old married couple. Paul was talking about him, too. I wonder if it's bugging him. Hey there. Hey, Nancy. Here I am giving everybody the benefit of my vast experience with women, and you're not even paying attention. Well, thanks for the benefit. It was a nice try. I'll give you that much. But who needs it? Well, come on, Nancy. It's time the old married couple went and got the refreshments. Does it really bug you that much that David and Nancy are going together? I, uh... I haven't really thought about it lately, I guess. Oh, it bugged me at first, because Steve and I used to do a lot of things together. We took lots of girls up, but hardly ever the same one twice. Then he started taking out Nancy more and more. They still invited me to go with him to movies and things, but I felt out of it if I didn't have a girl. Well, he didn't mean anything by it. Well, you know what kind of a nut he is sometimes, so why take him so seriously? Oh, I don't know. Maybe I'm just not in the right mood tonight. So I didn't see much of Dave for a while. Well, how long have they been going together? Let's see. Almost a year now, I guess. Anyway, long enough for you to be calling them an old married couple. Well, he really got to you, didn't he? I guess what I'm really trying to say is, did he get to you? Do you mean, did I mind Paul saying that about us? Yeah. Well, why should I? Maybe he's finally got it through his head that you're my girl. And that's the way it's gonna be, okay? Okay. Meanwhile, we better be getting back downstairs with the drinks. Let's have some music. Now there's yeah. a good idea. I'll get the record player. Here, let's clear this stuff out of here. Here, make yourself useful. Say, does anyone know what time it is? About 9.30, I guess. Oh, sorry I can't stay for the music, friends, but I have an English mm -hmm. test tomorrow, and as usual, I'm not ready for an English test tomorrow. But it isn't even 10 o'clock yet. Yeah, well, look, Paul's English test is my English test, too. So I guess I better get going. Say, can you stop over at my place for a few minutes and go over my English notes with me? Yeah, I guess so. You know, that's how we did on yeah. the Now, there's a couple of real swingers. So, look, it's only Tuesday, and there's no way my mother will go along with anything after 11.30 on a school night. And on Fridays and Saturdays, you go all snaky and stay up till midnight? Try me. Oh, I didn't mean it. I mean, I was just joking. Every time I open my big mouth. You busy Friday? No, but... No, but. You and I have a big date Friday, okay? Okay. I've got to go. Dave. Yeah, okay then. Well, we'll see you later, Carol. I'll be right back. Yeah. Way to go, Carol. That's the way to make the big impression. Keep this up and he'll be throwing rocks at you in no time. Oh, boy. The only guy in the whole school who isn't a creep. And he's available. So, what do you do? Right away, you ruin the whole thing. Well, what do you think? I guess I managed to ruin a perfectly good Tuesday evening night for just about everybody, eh? Ruined it? What do you mean, ruined it? It worked, didn't it? What worked? Look, the point is, you're going out with Paul Friday night, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, but the way it happened, I figure you still think of something to get out of it. Like getting a hangnail. No way. I know Paul well enough to know he's intrigued. Man, that girl's really something, isn't she? Yeah, well, she had you going there for a while. Well, you gotta admit, she does come on a little bit like gangbusters. Yeah, and you jump right into a neat little trap. What? Well, Friday night of me. That was my idea. Oh, yeah, old buddy, your idea all the way. Ah, oh, forget it. Say, you and Nancy doing anything this Friday? Like what? Oh, I don't know, like going to the movies or something. You can't afford it. Can't afford it? Nope. Well, Wednesday's Nancy's birthday, and I want to buy her something. And then Friday's the school dance. I gotta budget the loot, man. I just can't make it. Ah, uh, come on up and I'll show you my notes in English testimony. Isn't it too late? Not for scores. Mom will probably give me a little static with her in the study. Going steady has got to be a drag. Fine birthday presents. And there's no way you can get out of going in the school dance. I don't know, man. I just can't see it. Yeah, well, you just don't know what you're missing. Well, when you really like somebody, the way I like Nancy, then you want to buy birthday presents. You want to go to the school dance. It's not something you do because you have to. Well, come on. Let's go look at those English notes. I could talk about going steady all night and you still wouldn't understand. Yeah, but it does cause money problems. Hey, grab a chair. So I'll uh, spring for the tickets if you and Nancy will come on Friday. Nah, I don't think Nancy would go for that. Uh, could be uh, you might need a little moral support come Friday. Well, uh, could be. Uh, in that case, I guess Nancy wouldn't mind. Yeah, David and I talk over everything. Of course, we've been going together for nearly a year now. I was going steady before we moved here, but it wasn't like that. I went out with Frank a few times, but then we moved. I guess it wouldn't have come to anything anyway. I only missed Frank because I didn't have anyone else to go out with. 
Well, so far, Paul thinks going steady's for the birds. I keep saying it's only because he hasn't met the right girl. But David doesn't think so. He says when I talk like that, I'm only making noises like a female. <laughs> Who knows? But let's face it, Paul is cute. Anyway, I better get going. Too bad they have to go. Thanks for asking me over tonight. Kind of lonely, you know, living in a new place. I went to a couple of things at school, but I went by myself. I felt so strange I didn't stay long enough to get to know anybody. Well, you know, I can't imagine living any place else. I've lived here all my life, and now, of course, there's David. I wouldn't want to move away from where he is. I have an idea he feels exactly the same way. Guess that's the way it should be. I don't really know what going steady is all about, I suppose. Well, all I can say is, for me, it's terrific. Nancy and David have been going together almost a year, and they think it's terrific. Is it? What do you think? Are Nancy's parents beginning to think it's time she tried dating others besides David? What would your parents say? What are some of the implications of going with one person for more than a year? What happens if they break up? Paul says going steady is a drag, and he means it. Is he being forced into a situation he doesn't want by pressure imposed by his friends? Dating is important in the development of your relationship with the opposite sex, as well as in your own development as a person. What do you think is the best way for you to participate? By going steady with just one person? Or by playing the field and dating many different people? <laughs>